children may be dismissed at this time. I invite you to turn to the New Testament, the uh, book of Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew, the Good News according to Matthew. And we are in a series, it's going to be a long series, through the book of Matthew this year. Sometimes we're going to take some pretty large chunks of Scripture, sometimes we're going to take some smaller chunks of Scripture. This is considered one of the smaller chunks of Scripture. Looking at Matthew 5, 17 through 26, it's in what's called the Sermon um, on the Mount, it's a message given by Jesus. And it's a powerful message on kingdom ethics, really what kingdom life is, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in this world, living as a disciple of Jesus in this world. Now, first thing I have to do is apologize, because uh, I wrote down early in the week for the title of this message that anger is murder, and you'll see that on your handout. That's not true. Biblically, that's not true. You see that this morning. Not all anger is murder. There's a good anger, there's a righteous anger, and there's an unrighteous anger. Okay, so that's why I got changed and everything else, but I forgot to change it in the one place I needed to change it to make sure that I got changed on the bulletin. <laughs> so anger can be murder. Okay? Anger can be murder. It depends on the motivations for it and what it is being utilized towards and for. So first things first, uh, apologies for, for the title on, on that. Now, I confess to um, the council that was meeting before the service were prepared, I'm a little bit nervous about this message. And I'll be honest with you, uh, talking about a message on anger, ironically, can stir up anger. <laughs> Uh, this is what law does. I'm going to talk a little bit about law this morning and how law operates in the Bible and its purposes and what Jesus is using it primarily for in the Sermon of the Mount. Because if we get law wrong, we get lots of things wrong. And this is going to be in tandem to what I talked about last week. So last week was very important. We talked about the Beatitudes. And the main message of the Beatitudes is grace. Grace, 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 grace all the way through. The attitudes weren't things that we were supposed to do to be blessed. But they were states of being that despite being poor in spirit, despite mourning, despite being hungry, we're blessed because ours is the kingdom. And that we will be comforted. Those are the reasons why. Grace, grace. So grace precedes everything. It's very, very important as we dive into the sermon, as we dive into law. There's a lot of law in the Sermon on the Mount. And if we don't have grace... Under that law, we can lead, we can end up in some very, very bad places. So grace is important for us to remember where we're coming out of um, for the rest of this. But I'm confident that we will navigate this well, and by the grace of God, we will grow in faithful discipleship with him as we understand uh, righteous anger and unrighteous anger and the destructiveness of unrighteous anger anger and the hell of righteous anger. Uh, with that in mind, what I've been doing before is kind of going through some pictures of uh, kind of grounding us a little bit with some visual of what um, the Sermon on the Mount, the area of Israel looked like. Some of you are aware that uh, Char and I had the opportunity to go to Israel for a couple weeks, a couple of years ago. So again, this is this is somewhere on these plains or on these hills right here. This is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee looking uh, southwest where this is at in Israel, Sea of Galilee, in the southwest, somewhere on these hills right here is where Jesus actually sat down with his disciples and a crowd around him and uttered these words. And I know for you, it takes some of this oftentimes philosophical, theological, up in the air, heady kind of stuff and says, Jesus sat in the grass. He probably had ants crawling on him and a mosquito biting him here and there and the sun beating down onto him where he's getting hot and sweaty and had to shift positions can somebody get a glass of water for me because I'm dying of thirst here? You know, kind of thing. Just to make this a little more tangible in real life for us, that this took place in time and history. Next picture. So, again, Beatitudes, grace. Jesus is about grace first. Grace and love always first. And we're blessed in these states because ours is the kingdom by the grace of God. And the next slide. 
So law and grace, I've talked about, there's going to be dynamic that happens between law and grace. Now we have law here first, it's because we're going to be talking about that today, but grace precedes law. Grace always precedes law. And one way to look at it is creation. The creation of this world was done as an act of love and an act of God's amazing grace, abundant uh, grace. And then he gave us law in there, do not eat of the tree of life, uh, of, of the knowledge of good and evil, excuse me. The tree of life is a good one to eat from. So grace always precedes law. Next slide here. So here's the deal that's going to be happening over the next month and a half or two months or so, all the way up until Easter. Jesus is raising the bar. He's not softening this for anybody, for you or for me. He's upping the ante. He's leveling up for those of you who are into computer games. This is something that is going to challenge you, and it's going to challenge me. If it doesn't, we're not hearing this correctly. It's meant to challenge. It's what law does, in a sense. So we're going to be looking at anger. And we're going to see that anger is not just physically killing somebody. You kill people with your words. That's a powerful statement. Because now we're all murderers. Everyone walking out of here must understand themselves. You are a murderer. And if you're not hearing that, you're not going to hear the message of the law. But that's law. Grace triumphs over law. That's not where we're going to leave it. Um, at all, but we have to know that this raises the bar. Next week we're going to talk about lust and adultery and all of you are going to walk out knowing you are adulterers. And this is the upping of the law to own this for ourselves and for myself as well. Um, one more on here. So here's a picture of anger. <laughs> In case you're not, you don't have some anger boiling underneath you right now and Forget what anger feels like or looks like. Here it is. And as this picture demonstrates, anger kind of builds up. It sees underneath. It builds if it's not dealt with uh, correctly. And you will explode, either verbally at somebody or physically at somebody, or it will explode inside you and destroy you inwardly. Okay? Either way. Unrighteous anger will destroy. And sometimes both. Outwardly it will destroy others, and it will destroy you in the process. So I'm not surprised he, does, he starts with anger. This is the first one he goes to because he knows it's so prevalent in our world uh, today. Now, with that in mind, let me read from Matthew 5, our passage. He's going to talk about law, and he's going to talk about anger. Then we'll pray, pray and dive a little further into this. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these, of the least commandments, and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Heavenly Father, as we dive into these words of your Son Jesus, I pray that our hearts and our minds will be open to the work that you want to do in each of our lives, myself included. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
There's a picture of the Atlantic uh, magazine, and this happens to be their last um, issue in January and February. Actually, I think it's 2019, so a year ago. Uh, titled, Why Are We So Angry? And there's an article in this, and again, if I put up a magazine or a movie or something like that, it doesn't mean I endorsed it, by the way. It just happens that I found that article and it was related to that. Some people jump to conclusions that, oh, he must endorse this or endorse, I don't. Um, I just use it for the particular purpose for the message. So I don't read The Atlantic, but this would be a good article for this. There's an article by Charles Duhigg in The Atlantic um, a year ago asking the question, why are we so angry? He's addressing the fact that it seems that our nation is an angry, angry nation, and we're getting more and more polarized around anger. And I doubt there's a single person here that would disagree with that. Uh, it is, there's a lot of anger in our country. Uh, he did uh, this article, and he cites a professor, prefer, pre excuse me, um, Professor James Averill. He did a study back in 1977, so a long time ago. Uh, he's a sociologist, and what he did, he, he found um, an average town, the most average town he could possibly find. And it turned out to be a place called Greenfield in Massachusetts, a small town of about 18,000 people. Completely unremarkable. There was nothing about it that stood out. There's a bunch of folks going about their daily business, going about life, and there was nothing that stuck out about it. They were just average folks, middle income, average people. And that's exactly who he wanted to uh, address and, and ask them questions. So he did a study of this town and, and sent letters to all of them and asked them to respond. Um, how often have you felt annoyed or angry this last week? And he had pretty modest expectations of this. He really wasn't thinking very many people were going to respond and most of them were going to throw it in the trash. But he was amazed that the majority of the people responded and sent letters back and they kept pouring in and there were just stories of anger after anger because he didn't ask just that one question. He asked quite a few questions to expose what was this anger like, describe what happened, what did you do, what were you feeling during and after, afterwards. We asked a lot. It was, you know, like a voyeuristic look into anger. Um, he was diving deep into this and he exposed a lot about what was going on, that this average sleepy little town was a very angry little town back in 1977. And things obviously have not gotten any better in America since then. Um, little things from people cutting you off in traffic, um, arguing over who's going to be taking the trash out and angry that you had to take it out again or having to eat the same thing over again, or some little squabble between a spouse, who's gonna, who's gonna get up and feed the baby tonight. Um, things that are everyday kind of things turned into big fights and anger and hostility toward one uh, another. Uh, anger is a part of our society. And again, I submit to you that that's not a bad thing all in itself. There is a good anger, a righteous anger that we ought to have. We'll talk about, about that in just a little bit here. Um, but there's also very much an unhealthy anger that destroys and so forth. Now if you don't connect with the Atlantic in this kind of way, there's, there's another image that you can take a look at. And that's from the movie Elf. We're not that far out from Christmas, so... Remember the angry elf scene? Alright, well... For those of you who know, fine, raise your hands. Those who don't know, you can go talk to them in that bit. We don't want to be an angry elf. <laughs> uh, Buddy, in all his innocence, uh, sees a short person, and because he worked with elves in the North Pole, he thinks the short person is an elf and calls him an elf. Intending no harm, but the angry short person got very upset about that, obviously, and attacked him some hostility. It's called the Angry Elf um, by, by Buddy. And here's another one if that one doesn't connect with, with you. Hulk is the epitome of anger. He smashes. That's what he does. We embrace, we love Hulk because he smashes. He, he allows us to release some of our inner, inner anger in smashing things. Who doesn't like to smash something every once in a while and destroy something? And they're doing some work around our house and they're pounding stuff out and destroying things like let me get out there. I want to do some of this. There's some cathartic, some cathartic um, energy that's involved with, with this. One little 
comment about the Hulk. Um, they were trying to get him angry to turn into the Hulk, Bruce Banner. Do you remember a line with that? And we need you to get angry. Can you get angry right now? I'm always angry. That's not the problem. The problem is suppressing the anger. And I submit to us, myself included, that a lot of people are a whole lot more angry than we like to admit to. It's just seething right underneath, ready to pop out, ready to become the Hulk. All right, so there's a lot of image that we can, we can uh, attach to um, here. So um, first thing I want to come back to is salt and light. Okay? We left that a little early last week. But Jesus goes right out of the attitude. He's grace. and gives you an identity statement. Because me and identity says, you are salt, you are light. Each one of you here is a disciple of Christ. That is part of your identity that Jesus gives you. And it's by grace. You don't earn it. He doesn't say, you are salt and light because you are a marvelous, wonderful, beautiful, looking, outstanding person. He doesn't say that. It says, you are salt and light, and it ties into the grace, by the grace of God, you are salt and light. It's important because it's an identity statement of who we are. Salt and light both have redemptive, um, good, reconciliatory kind of connotations in our world. Salt and light are good things. They preserve, salt does. It has flavor. Light exposes things in a good way. We don't want to be sitting here in darkness. We want to be in light. We install lights. We have windows that we can see through. Light is a good thing. That's our identity. So coming into this, there's a, there's a way to approach anger as disciples of Christ that honors Christ and acts as salt and light in this world. And there's a way that is going to be not honoring Christ and the kingdom and will actually do just the opposite. So Jesus brings in law. And how does this law and grace work together? So first of all, Jesus says that he is the fulfillment of law. He didn't come to abolish the law. So some of them thought that he was going to get rid of law. Apparently Jesus was a lot about grace and love. And we see that through a lot of his teachings. And so some of them thought he's just getting away, doing away with the law. And he's upping the ante for the law. Law has always been, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law of all laws that we talked about some last week. So Jesus says, I'm not going to abolish the law, the Ten Commandments. Those are all good. And we'll see that in a second here, too. And Paul says those are good. In fact, he says in Romans 8 and verses 1 through 5, says, The law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us who walk according to the Spirit. A lot of fancy language there. What that just means is that Jesus lived the perfect life that we could not. His righteousness, his right living becomes ours, that we might live rightly toward one, one another. Might. Then say you will. As disciples, we will and will stumble, but as not disciples of his, we will not. So Jesus fulfills the law. He's the perfect uh, one who does not commit any sin. Now, that's a secondary reason. The primary reason what it means for Jesus to fulfill the law is that he is the fulfillment of the law, that he himself and his teachings bring to the full fruition what law is all about. He is the truth. Law is truth. You want to see truth, you want to see law, you look at Jesus, and he's the perfect example and fulfillment of that. Now think about this, this is stunning. Jesus in all his life, if anybody has a right to be angry, Jesus does, right? And we'll see this in a second. He is an angry person. How many of you thought of Jesus as an angry person? How many of you picture in your face anger on Jesus' face? It's got to be there. Not all the time, but it is an expression of who Jesus is, a true expression of um, keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that toward the very end, especially for communion here. Uh, he says, your righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. Quick note, can't do that. It's impossible. He's saying, basically, you're going to look at the law. It's going to expose your sinfulness and your need for a Savior. You can't do law any better than what the Pharisees have been trying to do the law. Not possible. You can't surpass it. You will fail. It's not going to happen. So how do, we, how do we engage with law in Scripture? There's a lot of law in Scripture. 693 laws in the Old Testament that the Pharisees are trying to 
live out every day. They have a belief that if the pair, they can live that out perfectly for one day, the Messiah will come. And that's what they're trying to do, even if they fail. So three things, just real quickly, that law functions in Scripture. Okay, there's only three ways. One is that it's a mirror. You kind of already heard this a little bit. It's a mirror. Uh, it allows us to see our sinfulness. So when there's a law that says, uh, do not anger somebody with your words, or excuse me, do not murder somebody with your words, or murder them physically as well, um, we look at that law and say, oh man, I'm guilty of this. Now most of us say, I'm not guilty of this law because I've never physically killed somebody. I don't think anybody here's a murderer who has physically killed somebody. And we're always hell. Skip over, next, got that one, check off, I'm righteous here. Jesus says, no, no, stop. You say, Raha, or Morona, at somebody's Greek, for you empty-headed moron. Literally, that's what it means. Raka means you empty-headed person. And Morona is what we saw last week. When salt loses its saltiness, the losing its saltiness, it's the word Morona. Same word here, just in a different tense. Calling someone a moron. You've killed that person. You're a murderer. You murder them with your words. When you murder someone, it's a hostile act, right? It's a destructive act. And that's what he's getting at. Your thoughts and your thinking and your words go down to hurt people, destroy people, tear them down when it's in an unrighteous kind of way. So it's a mirror. The second thing is uh, it's a restrainer. It's this kind of a civil use of law, right? So it's like 65 miles per hour on the freeway, it's a law. Why? They're trying to minimize accidents and killing people, is what they're trying to do. Wear a seatbelt, why? It's a law. They're trying to save lives, in a sense. There's some civil use to law that tries to restrain evil. You don't have that, get rid of you know, 125 miles per hour down the road and maybe cause problems. Simple. It tries to restrain it to some degree. You can't eliminate it, but restrain it. And the third one is um, a revealer. Um, it reveals the way that God wants us to live in this world. Very similar to uh, the mirror one. The mirror reflects our sinfulness, but the law, the law does. But it also reveals how God wants us to live. You shall know where the God is before. Love neighbors yourself. Love God. These are laws that reveal how God wants us to live. So a mirror, a restrainer, and a revealer of how God wants us to live. Okay, so let's dive into anger here for this last portion here. Now anger can be murdered. Now, just to be clear what we're talking about here, uh, anger, by definition, is a feeling of sudden and strong displeasure and antagonism directed against the cause or an assumed wrong or injury from another person or group so a sudden, strong displeasure and antagonism. The key word's antagonism. There's an against here, okay? Um, and in the, the passage we're looking at, Jesus expands this antagonism from just a physical antagonism toward another person where you destroy the other person to an antagonism of words, a verbal antagonism toward another person. Curtis Vaughn says this, that we have to be carefully guarded with anger so as not to pass into sin. <coughs> anger that is selfish, undisciplined, and uncontrolled is always sinful. And even that which starts out as righteous <coughs> indignation all too easily degenerates to this level. But he's recognizing here that we can recognize a wrong that has been done to us and rightfully be angry toward that. <coughs> When it is a rightful, moral wrong that's been done against you, um, there's, a, there's a healthiness to recognize that a sin was committed and to be angry at that sin. I know this is cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. You know, you hate the sin and love the sinner. There's some truth to that. That's why it's a cliche. We hate sin. As disciples, we do not embrace sin in any kind of way. We don't want to water it down. Sin needs to be expanded upon, not minimized. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here with that we can hurt people with, or murder people, not just hurt and murder them with, with our words. And that a righteous, or a righteous indignation or a rightfully angry against sin can turn very quickly into an unrighteous anger where we want to destroy the other person with our words or even physically even worse. 
tear them down, make them feel awful. Revenge. What does Jesus say about revenge? Do not do it. We're going to see that coming up here. Don't do revenge. It's not even, it's not even on the playing field for you or for me as disciples. You just take it right off the playing field. We don't do that. Because revenge, by definition, from a human standpoint, is sin. We can't do it. Jesus can, he said, basically, let God handle the revenge portion of it. He's the judge. He'll dole out everything. He's the one that will handle all that. We don't, we don't do that. Why? Because anger. Anger turns uh, righteous indignation into unrighteous indignation, and we start tearing people. Um, so you get this distinction between righteous anger and unrighteous anger, and it's a slippery slope right into the one from the other. Because it's not a long leap from righteous to unrighteous uh, anger. Now I mentioned Jesus because we want to keep coming back to him and recognize that anger is okay. The right thing. Jesus was an angry person. I have some pictures here toward the end. Do you see that? Yeah. And I could not find, we don't, there's not a lot of angry pictures of Jesus. We just don't picture them that way. And if there are angry pictures, you don't want to see them because they're not great pictures to show. They're unbiblical pictures of Jesus being angry. This was a drawing by somebody. It's like, okay, I think this sort of captures Jesus with an angry face a little bit. Just to give you a visual of, hey, he was angry at times. You know the two times that point out when Jesus was angry? Okay, that's the famous one, yes. The money changers, exactly right. They, they took the temple of God, the presence of God, the Pharisees, they turned it into a consumeristic mall. A J.C. Penney, a Kohl's, a Nordstrom's, a market. And Jesus was angry, it says in there. Now, you saw here, he, he made a whip. And he's driving them out with a whip. That's anger. And he did not sin. This is the temple of God. Jesus, this is my father you're desecrating here. This is me you're desecrating here. You don't know that yet. This is the Holy Spirit you're desecrating here. Turning this temple into a consumeristic market for your material economic gain. Shame on you. Basically, get out of here. There's anger, righteous indignation here. What's the other one? Peter's paper. I'm just going to You, you can allude to that. There's another one where it shows, where it actually says Jesus got angry at him. Um, he asked him, is it sinful to heal on the Sabbath? He had a person with a withered hand. And the Pharisees refused to answer him because they knew, however he answered, they were going to be wrong. They, they, he was going to trap them. And Jesus said, he looked at them with anger. And there's that anger look at Jesus, at the Pharisees. And he turned around, out of that anger look, and he healed a man with a withered hand. So Jesus got angry. And it's okay if we have anger that is towards sin, but doesn't go toward the sinner to destroy them. So how do we navigate this a little bit to, well, first of all, uh, mitigate it as much as possible. But also, well, here real quickly, if you're in an angry situation, with, or someone has angered you, or did something wrong with you, the first step is reconciliation. If there's a true sin that has happened, from one person to another, reconciliation, Matthew 18, it's a simple way that we go about this. You go to the other person, acknowledge the wrong that has happened, and hopefully you work together for repentance and reconciliation as good disciples of, of Christ on the wood there. And that's what happens when sin has taken place, and anger is there. You go toward each other with reconciliation. And you, you might say, well, I don't want to. I'm too angry to do that. Well, how can we navigate some of the anger? Well, here's a few things to keep in, in mind. There's a whole lot more to this than just what I have here. But Well, first we talked a lot about hospitality. Hospitality is making room for others, including our enemies. And so when we start practicing hospitality, it starts to teach us to open up toward others with what I call, well, actually, I don't, Miroslav Wolf calls this, I, I love this phrase, and you've heard me say it already, and I'll keep saying it, um, the will to uh, embrace, to lead with the will to embrace, is what he calls. Which means that, that our steps toward each other is not one toward hostility toward the other person. Now it's pretty easy amongst even here it can get hard when we're angry at 
one another, or to even look at that person when you're angry at, at them, but to lead with a will to embrace. Practice that. Consciously look at the people around you and say, lead with a will to embrace. Which means I'm, I'm walking toward them with arms open, not fist looking for something wrong to punch and to smash old style or to go angry elf on the other person. Okay, so just let that will to embrace. Start with my day. I'm going to lead with a will to embrace. Here's a, here's a little more practical one. And this has to do with our, our lifetime of faith, really. Uh, count to ten. Not one, two, three. The first ten words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Ten words. You're angry? Say those words. Slowly and over. And get yourself in a new perspective. Our Father who art in heaven, you're not in heaven, you're not in control. A lot of anger issues, by the way, is because you lack control. And you want control over something. Someone's taken my control. That's the root of anger. I don't like it. God's in control. He's a sovereign. Whatever happens in my life, I'll learn to navigate it and not let righteous anger against the sin that might be there turn into unrighteous anger. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. The next one, and I, I found this over the years, because um, anger does not elude me at all. I struggle with this as much as anyone else here. Um, try whistling when you're angry. I found I cannot whistle when I'm angry. Maybe you can. It is impossible to whistle when you're angry, at least for me. So when you're, if you can't whistle, I don't know how bad it is. Just whistle in any capacity. You're angry. When you're angry, you tense up. It's hard to whistle. So don't do anything toward the other person until you can whistle well. <laughs> try it. Well, don't get yourself angry and try whistling. The next time you're angry, try whistling and see, see what happens. It works for me. Um, again, we're seeking reconciliation, not vengeance on the other person. We're looking to navigate truth with grace. We're discerning whether we're going to fight or flee in a good way. You can't fight in a good way. You flee at the time, so you come back and fight in a more healthy kind of way. Uh, the love one is it's more geared toward um, understanding that we're to love our enemies, not hate them, and not look to tear them down. That's where our world is today. We polarize, we label the other person, and we attack because they're not like us, they're different than us. And we may justify it because they're evil. They support evil things. Don't hear what I'm not saying. It's not that we're condoning or supporting the evil that's underneath that. But our will, our, to lead with a will to embrace is looking, how can we come alongside them and in some ways love them into the kingdom? And that does mean confrontation at times like Jesus confronted. Most of the time it means listening and hearing and responding in loving, gracious ways and not escalating the anger into a bitter kind of fight. Um, the last one here is, is the theme that we've been talking about over the last four or five months now. It's the putting on Christ. I think this image will help you as well. We're to put on Christ toward one another. And put off the old self. The old self is this unrighteous anger that looks to tear down and destroy others. The Putting on Christ is to be angry at sin. Be able to confront that in a loving kind of way with others. Don't let it escalate into unrighteous anger where it tears down on others. He says, do this immediately. Leave the altar. Go and reconcile. You're going to have a chance in a few moments where we're going to do communion. We're coming to the altar, so to speak. If you've got anger issues with somebody because they sinned against you, sin is the key word. You get angry about unsinful kind of things. That's not what we're talking about here. That's what you need to deal with yourself. You created a problem that is not conducive to anger in the sense of creating unrighteous anger toward another person. You have an opportunity to reconcile before you come up. And so Jesus said here, leave the altar, go and reconcile. Come. 
on practical, I'll close on this. Shar and I have been doing this for um, a very long time, right from the very beginning of our, our marriage, so over 20, 28 years. Um, and many of you may do this too. Uh, we don't go to bed without kissing each other good night. And I forsake, well, for is a little, you know, kind of thing, okay. but the act of kissing one another or expressing love to one another, you can't do that when you're angry. Try kissing someone when you're angry. <laughs> it doesn't go very well. And so it kind of puts you in a position to say, I need to, we need to reconcile this before the sun goes down. And that's exactly what Ephesians 4 says. Be angry, but don't sin. But don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because he knows, Paul knows, Jesus knows, you let anger root into your soul, it will take you down. And it'll take down the person around you or people around you as well. It needs to be dealt with quickly. All right, Jesus' fulfillment of law, teaches law, grace precedes law, grace triumphs over law. Thank God, because we're all sinners and we do not follow law well. We are angry people, and sometimes angry for the right reasons, a lot of times angry for the wrong reasons. But God is faithful and just, and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these practical words of Jesus on anger. There is a, a righteous anger, but also an unrighteous anger that seeks to destroy and tear down and get even with others. I pray that if any of that in our hearts, that we would expose that and we'd be open to dealing with that, that we might replace that with righteous anger, we might replace it with love, replace it with mercy and grace. Because we don't want to be known as disciples or as a church that is hostile and against things. We want to be a church and disciples that are known of what we are for. We are for your Son, Jesus Christ. We are for the kingdom. We are for love. We are for grace. We are for mercy. We are for forgiveness. We are for reconciliation. May that be what this church is known for as we seek to live out as your disciples in your kingdom. Jesus' name we pray. Amen.